They reported uh, on how the U.S. cannot keep track of these weapons, and a lot of them are not even reaching the front lines. What is actually our foreign policy goal here when we say that Russia is a threat? Corporate media just refuses to allow on people who apply minimal standards for evidence. And they're picking who the next Ukrainian government will be, and the person they had chosen to lead the new government is indeed this guy Yatsenyuk, who became the new Ukrainian leader. I think Yats is the guy. U.S. media never reports on the, the negotiations that have happened so far. The United States aids Ukraine and her people so that we can fight Russia over there and we don't have to fight Russia here. That was two years before Russia invaded. Recently, Zelensky on his Telegram channel published a picture of one of his bodyguards wearing some sort of Nazi symbol, and they quietly deleted that. I'm dying to know what your take is on Nord Stream. So I'm very excited to have a long overdue guest, frankly, on Bad Faith Podcast, Aaron Mate. You know him, you love him, from my favorite political podcast, The Useful Idiots with Katie Halper, and also a reporter from The Gray Zone. Welcome to Bad Faith, Aaron. Good to be here, Bree. Thanks for having me. It, 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 I, when I invited you, it really did strike me as insane. Is it really true that you haven't been on before? On your show, I, yeah, it's, it's true. Yes. I was racking my brain. I don't know. I don't know how that oversight happened. But look, when I saw um, the kind of the major media arc over the last few days uh, being about uh, nuclear escalation and the uh, broad conspiracy chatter about who, in fact, blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, there was only one person I wanted to talk to about it. So let's let's get right into it. Aaron, you, I think, have really distinguished yourself for having really um, prescient and uh, kind of culture bulking takes on uh, the U.S. relationship to Russia at a time when you took a lot of heat for saying some things that have been really borne out as true in the longer term. So I'm dying to know what your take is uh, on Nord Stream. Well, listen, thanks, Bree. Let me just uh, say in the interest of uh, being uh, fully transparent, I did get one thing wrong which is that I didn't think Russia would invade Ukraine. Mm. And uh, I was proven wrong on that. So I just mm. have to acknowledge that. But I haven't gotten everything right. But mm. I did get I did get right that Trump was not a Russian asset and mm -hmm. that Robert Mueller was not going to solve um, liberals' nightmares by bringing him out of the White House in handcuffs. I definitely got that one right. But uh, in terms of Nord Stream, well, look, I don't know who did it, but I strongly suspect that it was the U.S. or the U.S. and some combination of its allies and there's many reasons to suspect that. First of all, it's not just Russia that's accusing the U.S. There is a, a former Polish foreign minister, a current member of the European Parliament, who's the husband of Anne Applebaum, who's a leading neoconservative, writes for the Atlantic, you know, top proponent of the Ukraine proxy war. He tweeted immediately, thank you, USA, right. with a photograph of gas bubbling up from the Nord Stream explosion. And then he since deleted it. But I think he was just simply... Um, expressing gratitude because a longtime goal of the U.S. and some of its partners has been realized. And that's why Antony Blinken, the secretary of state, said a few days after Nord Stream was blown up that this is a tremendous strategic opportunity. Ultimately, um, this is also a tremendous opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity to once and for all remove the dependence on Russian energy and thus to take away from uh, Vladimir Putin the weaponization of energy as a means of advancing uh, his uh, imperial designs. Uh, that's very significant, and, and that offers tremendous um, strategic opportunity for, um, for the years to come. But meanwhile, we're determined to do everything we possibly can uh, to make sure that the consequences of all of this are not borne by citizens in our countries or, for that matter, around the world. And he said that because the U.S. for a long time has been trying to kill Nord Stream 2. Uh, Donald Trump is actually the president who most uh, aggressively led this campaign. He sanctioned the companies involved to try to stop the construction of Nord Stream 2. And there are many reasons for it. And they tie very heavily into the war in uh, Ukraine. I think the uh, top reason is that if you have Russia supplying directly to Germany and on to the rest of Europe, it becomes a lot harder to wage proxy warfare against Russia or to get your allies to support sanctions against Russia, because you're not going to want to be at war against a country that you're relying on for energy. And on top of that, um, you have the fact that energy is the main source of Russia's uh, domestic revenue. 
And there's a 2019 study put out by the RAND Corporation, which is a U.S. government funded organization that puts out these uh, policy documents for the U.S. government, which talks about all the ways, all the best, all the optimal ways for overextending and unbalancing Russia. Hmm. And some of the proposals include providing more lethal aid to Ukraine so that Russia will be forced to intervene there. Well, we know that that one's been checked off. And another one was when it comes to specifically stopping Russia's economy, weakening Russia's economy, the top step that it proposes is blocking Nord Stream 2. Because if you block Nord Stream 2, then you seriously weaken Russia's economy. Another reason is that, you know, Nord Stream 2, the, the reason why, especially people who are advocates of the Ukraine proxy war oppose it, is because you, Nord Stream 2 bypasses Ukraine entirely. Because right now you have a situation where even though Russia and Ukraine are at war, you still have, and you've had had this for the last eight years while there's been a civil war inside Ukraine with uh, Russia and the US on opposite sides, the situation where Russia ships uh, energy through Ukraine and on to the rest of Europe. And that's very good for Ukraine because Ukraine collects billions of dollars per year in transit fees. So if you have Russia shipping its oil, it, its gas elsewhere via Nord Stream 2, that takes away both that money from Ukraine, which is very lucrative for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And it also takes away a key point of leverage that the US has because Ukraine's basically at this point a client state of the US. And another reason is that if you take away Nord Stream 2 and you take away Russia's role as a major gas supplier to uh, Europe, then you force Europe into selling, uh, sorry, then you force Europe into buying American liquefied natural gas, which is what the US has been trying to push onto Europe for many years. Condoleezza Rice laid this out in 2014, mm -hmm. where she said, you want to change the structure of energy dependence and you want to be dependent on the North American energy platform. 80% of Russian exports are in oil, gas and minerals. Uh, people say, well, the Europeans will run out of energy. Well, the Russians will run out of cash before the Europeans run out of energy. And I understand that it's uncomfortable uh, to have an effect on business ties in this way. Uh, but this is one of the few instruments that we have. To, over the long run, you simply want to change the structure of energy dependence. You want to depend more on the North American energy platform, the tremendous bounty of oil and gas that we're finding in North America. You want to have pipelines that don't go through Ukraine and Russia. Uh, for years, we've tried to get the Europeans to be interested in different pipeline routes. It's time to do that. But it's just like, you don't have to be an energy expert to realize why that makes no sense. Like, why would you want to ship more expensive uh, liquefied natural gas across the Atlantic Ocean from the US to Europe when you have Russia right there uh, mm -hmm. in Europe supplying cheap energy, which is a lot cheaper than liquefied natural gas, as by the way, that RAND report that I mentioned acknowledges. So you certainly have a motive uh, in the US in wanting to sabotage the Nord Stream too. Yeah, so it's you mentioned the Condoleezza Rice clip. There's also this clip of Joe Biden saying, you know, if if it comes to this, there are ways. I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing, but there are ways to stop Nord Stream. And the reporter asked a follow up along the lines of, "Well, oh, how? What do you mean?" And Biden just kind of reiterates, "There are ways." If uh, if Russia invades, uh, that means tanks or troops crossing the uh, the, the border of Ukraine. Again, then uh, there will be uh, we there will be no longer a Nord Stream two. We we will bring an end to it. What do you, what, how will you how will you do that exactly? Since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control, we will. Uh, I promise you, we'll be able to do it. Never seen a moment. I mean, when this happened, I think most reasonable people thought, obviously, let's not jump to conclusions. Who knows what's happening here? Obviously, we live in a world where there's concerns about false flags and all of these, you know, theories abound. But rarely has there been as much documentary evidence of people telling on themselves between the Biden clip, the Condoleezza clip, the um, the tweet that you mentioned earlier. I, at, a cer at a certain point, it starts to feel very, very foolish not to follow the Occam's razor of it all. I mean, what, what in your view is a kind of, if any, reasonable pushback? What, are, what, are, what is the counter theory here? 
Well, look, let me just say, too, what's amazing about that Biden clip that you mentioned where in early February, he says, no matter what, uh, we have ways to stop the Nord Stream, too. Uh, you know, I promise you we'll be able to stop it. He's standing next to the German chancellor when he says that, Olaf Scholz. Huh. That was by his side. And the reason he said that, that we'll be able to stop it no matter what, is because Germany at that point was refusing to commit to the U.S. demand that if Russia invades Ukraine, that Germany will cancel Nord Stream, too, because... Mm -hmm. This was, you know, the reason why and the reason why even Germany and, and Biden were in that position is because when Trump tried to kill the Nord Stream 2, and by the way, most of the U.S. public didn't hear about Trump's campaign to kill Nord Stream 2 because that undermined the narrative that he was really a Trump asset. So we just kind of mm -hmm. put that aside, mm -hmm. along with many other belligerent Trump policies that, that Trump took towards Russia, including killing vital nuclear arms control treaties and also uh, providing weapons to Ukraine that Obama refused to provide. Mm. Uh, but there, so when Trump did that, that really strained relations with Germany uh, because he was trying to kill their major <laughs> energy project with Russia, which they needed to power their economy. And, uh, you know, there was this mo there's there's reports where Trump is pressuring Angela Merkel behind the scenes saying, Angela, you can't expect us to pay for your defense while also you're giving money to Russia to buy their energy. You have to buy our gas instead. And Angela Merkel resisted. But then Schultz comes in, replaces her. And uh, Biden decides when he comes into office early on that this has caused such a strain with Germany. And Biden, meanwhile, is coming and saying we have to repair our relationships with our NATO allies, that all the damage that Trump did. So as a gesture to Germany, he actually dropped some of Trump's sanctions or he waived them. He exempted them, mm. but he didn't kill them for good. He left them open. And then when this Ukraine crisis began, that gave Biden a backdoor opportunity to basically pick up Trump's campaign to kill Nord Stream 2. And that's why he was saying next to Olaf Schultz that if Russia invades Ukraine, no matter what, we will kill the pipeline. And uh, Russia did invade uh, a few weeks later. And by that point, Germany had finally caved to the U.S. and they uh, canceled the Nord Stream, too. So, look, in terms of a counter narrative, um, what do people say? They say that Putin blew up the pipeline so he can show the rest of Europe what he can do, that he mm -hmm. can cut any of you off. Mm -hmm. But what these people have also said for years and why they claim to be so opposed to the uh, Nord Stream pipeline is that the pipeline gives Putin leverage over Europe, right? That you're, uh, Putin can turn off the taps at any time. So why would Putin blow up what the U.S. and its allies have previously denounced as his main form of leverage? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make any sense. And mm -hmm. if you know, and their argument that he blew it up to send a message, well, there are many pipelines you could blow up if you wanted to. <laughs> you know, yeah. he doesn't have to blow up his own. Yeah. So, and, and people were also pointing out and correct me if this is wrong, that the biggest investments in the pipeline had been or some of the biggest investments in the pipeline had been from Russia, that they had an significant uh, financial stake in the pipeline, yeah. that it was blown up at the Europe end as opposed to the Russia, the Germany end as opposed to the Russia end of the pipeline and, and in an area where Amer apparently America had been recently yeah. doing some kind of bomb testing. That's exactly right. If you look at the map of where the explosions were, they're they're a few hundred miles away, at least from Russia. They're not on the Russian area of the pipeline. Uh, they're near the waters of Denmark. And it's a lot harder for Russian uh, naval operatives to access the waters of Denmark, off of Denmark, than it is to access the waters off of Russia. So that's that's a great that's a great point. Yeah, they invested billions of dollars in this. And uh, this was a very lucrative project for Russia. And also a, a project that would, I think, you know, help Russia and that, it, again, if they have closer ties via energy to the rest of Europe, it makes it more difficult to impose sanctions on Russia and mm -hmm. to engage in conflict with Russia. So why Russia would want to blow up uh, this, for, this pipeline, which previously was recognized as, as its main form of leverage, makes no sense, especially when everybody knows that Germany has always had cold feet about this Ukraine proxy war. Uh, Germany helped broker the Minsk II Accords, which were supposed to put an end to the war in the Donbass that's been going mm -hmm. on for eight years, ever since a US-backed coup in 2014. Um, and Germany did not want to commit to killing Nord Stream 2. And Germany tried at the last minute to broker a peace deal. In fact, there was a report in the Wall Street Journal that days before Russia invaded, Germany offered to Zelensky, said, listen, what about a deal where you just declare neutrality Forget everything else for now. Just declare neutrality. So not joining NATO. And in return, you'll receive security guarantees from Russia and the U.S. Zelensky said no. So Germany has been trying very hard to uh, avoid all this. And so and Russia knows that. And so 
the pipeline is the main incentive that Russia has to offer Germany to get it to back out of supporting this proxy war. So mm -hmm. why would Russia blow that up now? And to me, I mean, assuming that somebody did this on the pro-NATO side, I, th I think the motive here is to remove any off-ramp that Germany has to take itself out of the proxy war coalition. So predictably, uh, that opinion, the idea that uh, the America could have been behind this is pretty much uh, uh, not, not acceptable. It's completely wiped from much of the corporate media coverage. Although there was this really interesting clip of uh, Jeffrey Sachs, guest on the show, uh, on Bloomberg, kind of casually making reference to the idea that the U.S. could have been behind it and causing uh, quite the little breakdown. The destruction of uh, the Nord Street pipeline, which I, I would bet was a U.S. action, perhaps U.S. and, and Poland. Uh, this is uh, right, Jeff. Jeff, we got to stop there. That's a that's a quite a statement as well. Why do you feel Absolutely. that that was a U.S. action? What evidence do you have of that? Well, first of all, there's direct radar evidence that U.S. Uh, helicopters, military helicopters that are normally based in Gdansk, uh, were uh, circling over this area. We also had the threats from the United States earlier in this year that one way or another we are going to end Nord Stream. We also have a remarkable statement by Secretary Blinken last Friday in a press conference that he says, this is also a tremendous opportunity. It's a strange way to, it's, uh, sorry, it's a strange way to talk if you're worried about the piracy on international infrastructure of vital significance. So I know this runs counter to our narrative. It runs, you're not allowed to say these things uh, in, in, uh, in the West. But the fact of the matter is, all over the world, when I talk to people, they think the okay. U.S. did it. And just to tell you, well, and, and by, by the way, even reporters on our papers that are involved tell me privately, yeah, well, of course, but well, it doesn't show up in our, our media. Professor, I, I don't want to get into the tit for tat about what did or did. What did you make of that response? Well, it's just a rare moment where someone's allowed on corporate television to state the obvious. Um, the uh, what has made the last six years so dangerous is that corporate media just refuses to allow on people who apply minimal standards for evidence and logic. I mean, that's why this conspiracy theory that Trump was a Russian asset, even while he was destroying uh, arms control treaties with Russia, even though while he was trying to kill the Nord Stream 2, even though while he was trying to overthrow Russia's main ally in Latin America, Venezuela, why that was allowed to persist for so long on corporate television is because no dissenting opinions were allowed. You just couldn't hear on CNN or MSNBC uh, the counter argument to why Trump might not be being blackmailed with a P-tape and related mm. uh, conspiracy theories. And so when someone like uh, Jeffrey Sachs goes on TV on, on Bloomberg and he says the truth or when he, he's gone before on MSNBC and talked about the reality of the U.S. role in the dirty war in Syria, uh, which essentially aided a insurgency dominated by Al Qaeda, it, it becomes controversial because you're just not otherwise not allowed to hear that opinion. Yeah, I, I got to say, Jeffrey Sachs has been having some takes recently. He's been very <laughs> outspoken about COVID. And he's someone who the like the establishment has imbued with a kind of seriousness and legitimacy that makes us all very inconvenient for folks who who don't want to be hearing what he's saying. So I got to I got to give I got to give Jeffrey Sachs some props here. And uh, another uh, big, big name uh, who weighed in on the Internet on this was the one and only Elon Musk, who tweeted a poll out, uh, which said Ukraine, Russia, peace colon. Here are your options. Redo elections of annexed regions under UN supervision. Russia leaves if that is the will of the people. Two, Crimea formerly part of Russia as it has been since 1783 until Khrushchev's mistake. Three, water supply to Crimea assured. Four, Ukraine remains neutral. And like, do you support that? Yes or no? 60% of the people voted no on that kind of a, a peace a peace solution. Before I, I go to like the public response to Elon Musk's proposal here, what do you make of how that poll landed? Well, it's amazing. He's been bitterly condemned uh, by the Ukrainian government who were trolling him. Like Z Zelensky was trolling him. And uh, there have been editorials written condemning Musk when really he was, I think, laying out a very sensible proposal. It was based on the will of the people in that region. Look, uh, it's uncomfortable for people who have bought into the proxy war narrative, but it is true that there are people inside Ukraine 
who have rejected the government that they've lived under since a U.S. backed coup in 2014. And look, I mean, you can get into all the details, but with Crimea, for example, Crimea, uh, the polls there overwhelmingly show, no matter who carries them out, whether it's Russian polling or anybody else, that the vast majority of the people of the people there support Russia's annexation. I wish Russia had done it properly and done a proper internationally supervised referendum. Mm. But there's no doubt if you talk to anyone who knows anything about Ukraine, the people of Crimea want to uh, live there. And part of the reason why this war is so dangerous, is because, you know, Ukraine's war aim is not just defending its own current territory. It's also in taking back Crimea, which is a red line for Russia. I mean, everybody across the Russian political spectrum, whether it's Putin or Navalny, supports the annexation of Crimea because they see mm. it as historically a part of Russia. And also it's long been home to Russia's most important naval base in the mm. Black Sea. And they're not going to give that up to a country that's trying to join uh, NATO. So uh, the Zelensky war aim was to try to retake uh, Crimea. And um, and he wants us to be on board with that, with no, with no questions asked. And and someone like Musk, who just puts out the possibility of uh, having put to a legit referendum, which is fair enough, uh, gets attacked for it. Because I, I don't think people, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so as you said, like he got all this, this pushback from Zelensky and others. And it's funny, he did this follow-up tweet that was like, let's try this then. The will of the people who live in Donbass and, and Crimea should decide whether or not they're part of Russia or Ukraine. Yes or no. And that poll went a little bit better. Like 60% <laughs> of people said yes. But what's yeah. funny to me about all of that is it seems like he had to translate his first tweet into the most simple basic terms. Like, should this be democratically uh, decided or not for people to kind of get that the diplomatic solution that he was initially proposing was exactly that. And I think that's very telling because there is almost no conversation about what any kind of peaceful resolution to this looks like. It has from the jump been characterized, any negotiation has been characterized as like kowtowing to Russia or wanting to bend the knee to Russia or somehow being in the pocket of Russia and wanting to do what Putin Putin wants as though a negotiation is could possibly ever be something that doesn't advantage both sides in some ways. Like the, that's the whole point of negotiation. And that feels like an especially dangerous place to be in, given that now there's such a robust conversation happening. I mean, it's been happening throughout and we've done episodes on it, but in, a, in the public sphere, it's, we have, we're having another spike of the conversation about the nuclear risk that we're in. What do you make of that? Yeah, look, and let me just say one more thing about the the Elon uh, Musk thing. If you look at what he's laying out there, you know, talking about the different uh, proposals for a vote in these regions mm -hmm. of Ukraine, the question should be asked, why are we risking a nuclear war over this issue? It's essentially a regional issue. Uh, there are people inside Ukraine who've been fighting for eight years. I think the main uh, reason is because the U.S. backed a coup and the new coup government, which included some fascists, waged the war on Ukraine's Russian speaking population and those in Crimea and elsewhere wanted, wanted to not live under that. That to me is the problem. But regard, even, if, even, if you even if you don't agree with that, why are we risking a nuclear war over that? And uh, that's a question that I wish was being asked because that's essentially what it is. I mean, if you look at his proposals, like his, that would actually, I think, address the core issues at stake here. And so why is this, wor why is this worthy of a nuclear war? And why are we spending billions and billions of dollars that could be spent on actually productive things uh, to fuel this war and to not have negotiations. And that, you know, like the question you raise is, is the critical one. And in fact, it's actually worse than just a situation where people who call for peace like um, like Musk are being attacked. It's also a situation where the peace uh, prospects that have already been pursued are just simply vetoed from reporting. So U.S. media never reports on the, the negotiations that have happened so far. And there are now multiple reports from both the Zelensky side and the Russian side and the U.S. side that earlier this year in March, there was serious progress toward a negotiation, that there was even a tentative outline reach between Ukrainian and Russian negotiators. Mm -hmm. but what happened was, and this comes from not from Russia, but from sources close to Zelensky, it was reported in the Ukrainian media in May that Boris Johnson, who was then the U.K. prime minister, presumably acting on U.S. orders because he's not he doesn't act on his own. He's a U.S. lackey, came over to Kiev and told Zelensky that if you negotiate with Putin, if you reach a deal that requires us to give you security guarantees, we're not going to have your back. So that was basically an order from the West to Zelensky to keep the proxy war going and not to talk to Putin. 
try to find a report on that anywhere in the U.S. And it came up again recently when Putin, for the first time, mentioned it in a recent speech. He accused the U.S. of basically wrecking the agreement that was reached between Ukraine and Russia. I couldn't find any mention of it anywhere except for a column by David Ignatius of the Washington Post. And he actually said, surprisingly, because he's very tied to the U.S. intelligence community, that actually Putin's comment about a possible peace deal that was sabotaged is an off-ramp now. But that's it. Mm. It wasn't reported in media. I mean, we can't even talk about it. So most Americans probably don't know that there was a settlement almost reached, but that it was vetoed under Western orders. And also another person to corroborate this is Fiona Hill, who wrote recently in Foreign Affairs that there was, according to U.S. officials, a peace agreement reached between uh, Ukraine and Russia, or at least the outline of a peace agreement reached between Ukraine and Russia. Now, Fiona Hill didn't mention what sources close to Zelensky had mentioned, but her writing that is just more proof that U.S. officials knew that this peace agreement was reached. And so why aren't we talking about it now? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good question, because, you know, the, the question from the beginning that I started asking long before I understood a single thing that had ever happened in the region <laughs> was in the in the process in February of scrambling to try to inform myself about it was why this conflict, why our involvement? Because the there there's a very easy slippage between asking questions about why the United States would invest its resources here as opposed to other parts of the world and a characterization of you as being kind of indifferent to the, you know, the innocence involved, the interest of people who are living in Ukraine, you know, like l- legitimate humanitarian concerns that exist again here and a million other places in the world where we don't decide to spend $80 billion uh, in lethal aid and the rest. And I'm happy to see that that conversation has matured a little bit over the course of the intervening months. But the any conversation of an exit game has been so stigmatized because it is considered to be a negotiation. It's like it's like a it's like a kind of we don't negotiate with terrorists kind of attitude about um, Putin. Now, though, with all of the discontent at home about the sheer volume of money that's being sent overseas. You're seeing, especially I see this with the Hill audience when we talk about this subject, there is a a bipartisan wellspring of anger about any number of problems that are happening domestically as we see a lot of money go out the door. And then we hear all of these excuses about how we can't afford for a student debt cancellation to fix the pipes in Jackson, Mississippi or anything else that's going on in the world. And on top of that, on top of that, we're now getting increasing red flags about um, whether or not this escalation is going to push Putin to a point where nuclear weapons are the only real possibility. We had Joe uh, Shishirone on the show months ago, a nuclear, uh, you know, arms expert talking about how part of the game with nuclear brinksmanship these days in the modern era has been to make smaller and smaller nukes that are easier and easier to use. And we've had folks walk through the possible outcomes here if there is no relaxation on the West part that looks like something along the lines of negotiation. On top of that, we're seeing this formalized request to join NATO from Ukraine. Like, how panicked should people be? Well, I mean, look, that's that's an individual decision, right? I, uh, Me, personally, if if I were betting, if I were betting on nuclear war, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, I just don't think. Um, Those uh, aren't famous last words, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> well, they might be, but they might be. But um, but I just don't. First of all, I don't even like militarily. If Putin was crazy enough to use nuclear weapons, I don't see actually what really advantage it offers him. But at the same time, I'm not a military strategist, so I don't know. But well, some people um, say, for example, he might no. shoot a little one over water, for instance. Do something yeah. that wouldn't necessarily provoke a yeah. strike on land that would kill, you know, the number of people that would potentially then get us all into the nuclear holocaust territory. But you yeah. know, just a little, just to see if we like it, you know, just <laughs> well, just just the tip nuclear brinksmanship is the, the idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that's quite possible doing some kind of test like that, or or yeah, listen, and uh, Putin certainly it, you, you listen listening to his speech. Uh, it was scary. He didn't sound like he was bluffing. And he said, I'm not bluffing. So, but they're also, you know, Russia does have milit has has a has a nuclear doctrine, which says that, you know, they don't use nuclear weapons unless there is a existential threat to the territory of Russia. And I would expect Putin to to follow that. I haven't seen any, any evidence that he that he wouldn't. But I guess the like the question for me is, I mean, the fact that we're even entertaining this question. That to me is just madness because 
ultimately for what? To not resolve a war that's been going on in Ukraine for eight years that the U.S. has been intimately involved in. I mean, recall that well before Russia invaded, Trump was impeached because he briefly paused some weapons to Ukraine while also uh, Rudy Giuliani was pressuring Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden and his son, Hunter. And when that happened, Adam Schiff got up on the House floor. He's the House impeachment manager. And in, in his opening address, he said that the U.S. aids Ukraine and her people so that we can fight Russia over there and we don't have to fight Russia over here. The United States aids Ukraine and her people so that we can fight Russia over there and we don't have to fight Russia here. That was two years before Russia invaded. So this fight's been going on for a long time. And why? Because we don't want to see, um, is it existential to American security that there's some kind of end to uh, a war, a civil war in Ukraine that started with a, with a coup that we had a pretty big role in? I mean, the U.S. backed the overthrow of the Ukrainian government in February 2014. I don't know how intimately involved the U.S. was, but they supported the overthrow. It brought to power a group that included a lot of fascists. They immediately essentially declared war on Ukraine's Russian-speaking population because this is the faction of Ukraine that really hates Russia and doesn't see its Ukrainian population or its Ukrainian uh, population that speaks Russian identifies with, with Russia as really the part of Ukraine. They identify with more the Banderite what, Nazi part that? of Ukraine. Is it, well, is it political? Is it ethnic? Is it linguistic? I mean, what? I mean, it's a long history, but it 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 dates back really to the, I mean the Second World War, where you have uh, uh, Stefan Bandera, who is a uh, Nazi collaborator who killed uh, many Jews in Ukraine. And they evolved out of that tendency. And that's why the Azov Battalion, which is a neo-Nazi brigade, um, worships Bandera and ha you know, has had nothing but contempt for Ukraine's Russian-speaking population. And, and, and when Russian speakers kind of rose up after this coup in February 2014. There's a very uh, infamous massacre in Odessa in May of 2014, where dozens of people were burned alive by these fascists, uh, people opposing the Maidan coup. And that helped set off this war where Russian speakers rose up with Russia's help against the coup government. And so we're now going to risk nuclear war because we don't want to solve that conflict, even though, by the way, we've we've officially signed on to the Minsk Accords, which were reached in 2015, which which actually have a pretty reasonable solution, which basically says that the Russian speaking regions of the Donbass will demilitarize and in return, they'll be given some limited autonomy, but that within Ukraine's sovereign borders. So forget separating and joining Russia. These uh, republics of Donetsk and Luhansk and the Donbass would stay inside of Ukraine. That was the formula agreed to in 2015. Ukraine signed it, the separatists signed it, uh, but the U.S. refused to put any pressure on Ukraine to actually implement it. And instead, the Ukraine's far right essentially won. And whenever Ukraine has tried, like Zelensky actually was elected on a mandate of peace to actually end this war. And mm -hmm. when he tried to take steps towards implementing it, the far right in Ukraine threatened his life and threatened to overthrow him like they overthrew Yanukovych in 2014. And Zelensky caved, you know, understandably, because he's he doesn't have the 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 uh the the power to stand up to them and the u.s essentially sided with the far right and that's why we're in the war we're, that we're in today and is it worth risking nuclear war just to keep that going i, I don't i don't think so am, am i remembering it right that i, I mean I, I feel like i've heard someone give me the rejoinder that the issue with Minsk, not a real issue but america's position was that in exchange, if the deal were in exchange for demilitarization and the Russian regions, they basically got, you know, an opportunity to vote on one of two. There were two kind of like economic deals being offered to Ukraine, one the Western IMF kind of a deal that imposed a lot of austerity. And there's like a, a Russian allied kind of a deal option that they could take that would, I mean, it wasn't great either, but it seemed like if given put up to a vote, people would have chosen Russia over over the West, and that was part of why they didn't want the there to actually be the demilitarization. And if it if it came with the possibility of kind of losing out in a democratic way on being able to impose our kind of Western uh, austerity yeah. politics on the country. I think the reason that the U.S. opposed Minsk is because if you give these regions autonomy, then they could possibly hold a card on Ukraine joining NATO. 
Uh, mm. They could basically block Ukraine from joining NATO if you have this autonomous region that doesn't want to join NATO. Mm. I think that was I think that was the reason. Mm. Uh, what you're talking about with austerity that was before that was the in the events leading up to the Maidan coup of 2014, mm. and it's very important. In the fall of 2013. Uh, Carl Gershman, who was then the head of the National Endowment for Democracy, it's like a U.S. government funded intelligence cutout. It funds movements around the world to destabilize and overthrow governments that we don't like, you know, very active in Haiti, Venezuela, anywhere the U.S. wants to have regime change. He wrote a piece in The Washington Post where he called Ukraine uh, in that region of the world. He called it the biggest prize. And he explained that if Ukraine can be brought firmly into the U.S. led orbit, then that could redound to Russia and possibly even lead to Vladimir Putin's overthrow. And very shortly after that, uh, a few months later, protests broke out that gave the U.S. a very big opportunity to pursue that goal of seizing the Ukrainian prize because Ukraine was trying to negotiate an agreement to um, have closer trade ties with the European Union, a European Union association agreement. And the president at the time, Yanukovych, although he's now widely portrayed as a Russian stooge, he really wanted to make that deal. He wanted to uh, join the EU in having closer economic integration and actually turn away from Russia. Uh, or at minimum, he wanted to have to, like, to play it both ways, but like have ties to Russia, but also have ties to the EU. But the problem is he read the fine print and the fine print of the EU, as we know they do everywhere, was harsh austerity, like mm -hmm. cutting pensions, cutting energy subsidies. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, you know, abandoning the people who had elected him. And for him, it would have been political suicide. So he he stalled and he didn't sign it. And that led to these massive protests from people who really wanted to join the EU and also were really opposed to Yanukovych's corruption because he was like pretty much every other Ukrainian politician, very corrupt. So you had these massive peaceful protests. That was a genuine, you know, uh, anti-corruption movement in the Maidan in uh, November 2013, protesting him. Uh, and at that point, Russia comes in and offers him a better deal. Hmm. They're not actually yes, this is familiar. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're not forcing him to make the kind of uh, politically suicidal demands that the EU was imposing on him. And so Yanukovych then moves to sign that. And the protests continue uh, into 2014, but at a certain point, they kind of die down. But what's left, and you can read about this, you know, in the Washington Post and foreign policy, uh, is a hardcore group of fascists, uh, groups like the right sector um, and C-14, you know, far right gangs. And they've who've taken credit for actually leading the coup that followed uh, in in uh, in late February 2014, where after attempts were made to broker some kind of compromise agreement, Yanukovych agreed to some sort of new transition government and the new elections. But when the leaders of the Maidan came back to the you know, encampments and presented this deal, they said, no, we want him gone. And essentially, uh, Yanukovych fled the country, fearing for his life. And mm -hmm. you had a new government installed, and that government was led by someone named Yatsnyuk. And that was around the same time that a call was leaked in which Victoria Nuland, who was then a top State Department official, and she's now back under Biden, was speaking to the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. And they're picking who the next Ukrainian government will be and the person they had chosen to lead the new government is indeed this guy, Yatsenyuk, who became the new Ukrainian leader. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tani Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week. You know, I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, it, I, think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. So that's the background. And soon after that, you have Russian speakers rise up because they see this new coup government as an assault on their identity. Yeah. I, I mean, I, you mentioned, you know, the um, the, the Azov Battalion and the, the, the fascism of it all a little bit earlier. And I was reflecting on how that still is such a it's such a polarizing point to bring up at any at any moment. Uh, with a certain cohort of American politicos. So, you know, if a couple of weeks ago, um, John Stewart got into hot water because he was presenting an award to someone who ended up having that son insignia, Azov tattoo on his arm. I don't, you know, obviously don't think it's John Stewart's fault or <laughs> he knowingly did it. But we do keep having these instances where people just happen to keep being Nazis. And there's this real sort of um, denialism about the kind of relevance or presence even of Nazis or far-right people 
among members of the Ukrainian army. And I understand on some on some level, folks are responding to the idea that we shouldn't help a community, assuming that you think that we should be involved in the first instance because there are bad apples among their bunch. And people say things like, well, we have people in the American military who obviously are racist and love their um, Confederate insignia and all these kinds of things. So wouldn't we want allies to help us even if we have some minority among us who are bad people? And I totally, I totally take that argument. But I, I had this exchange with uh, Chang Uger recently where even just the vaguest of allusions to the idea of there being any any element there that we should have concerns about arming um, really set them off. And like really, it really sets people off. They get very, very angry if you if you if you reference Azov. And I, I wonder what you make of that. Well, the reason they get angry is because they've been propagandized to believe that any reference to Azov is just Russian propaganda. And they don't have the critical thinking skills to be able to ask themselves, is this factual or not? Did, did case, Russians put a put a Nazi in front of John Stewart to exactly, give a medal to? <laughs> exactly. And look, I mean, look, as as a perfect illustration, uh, recently Congress welcomed a delegation from Ukraine, mm -hmm. and it included members of the Azov Battalion. So that mm -hmm. this is that's now in 2022. Well, in 2018, just four years ago, that same Congress passed a measure banning U.S. assistance to the Azov Battalion, mm -hmm. specifically Azov Battalion. And the reason they did this is because at that point, 2018, this is four years after the coup, it was just so obvious that Azov uh, was having a major role in the Ukrainian military. They're formally incorporated. It's not as if you have some random members who are Nazis. This is a neo-Nazi paramilitary force that is formally incorporated inside the Ukrainian military. There are reports in the gray zones covered this of U U U.S. military trainers actually working with members of the Azov battalion. And it's becoming such a problem that con even Congress, for all its support for the Ukrainian government, had to do something. And they passed mm -hmm. this. So we've gone from banning assistance to the Azov Battalion to greeting the Azov Battalion in Congress and looking the other way as our weapons go to them. Because, yes, everyone knows that no matter what kind of law you have on the books in the U.S., once these weapons reach Ukraine, there's no way to track them. U.S. officials have admitted this. You can't track where your weapons go. So undoubtedly, despite U.S. law, weapons are going to Azov. And it's not, you know... The fact that so many people keep getting caught wearing Nazi insignia, it doesn't dent the propaganda wall. Uh, recently, Zelensky on his Telegram channel published a picture of one of his bodyguards wearing some sort of Nazi symbol, and they quietly deleted that. And the U.S. media doesn't report on it because it's just simply too inconvenient. And if you look at the way Azov has been described in establishment media outlets over the last mm -hmm. eight years... They've gone from being called, as like the New York Times called them, openly neo-Nazi, an openly neo-Nazi paramilitary organization. Then after the inv Russia's invasion happened, all of a sudden they became far right. And then it even morphed to just being a paramilitary group. So we've just yeah. somehow in these eight years, they've gone through maybe some sort of sensitivity training by the U.S. <laughs> that removes their Nazi beliefs. But it's unbelievable. And look, it's, it's very similar to what happened in Syria when everyone just looked the other way as you know, so-called moderate rebels were really an insurgency that was dominated by Al-Qaeda. And the U.S. knew that. That's obvious from the internal documentary record. There's a Defense Intelligence Agency report from the summer of 2012, which says the insurgency is dominated by Al-Qaeda and other Salafist jihadists. And we're just supposed to look the other way because they're achieving goals that we're supposed to support, I suppose. But the facts don't change. And it's amazing how little media scrutiny has been applied to an issue that the media used to factually report on. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the the denial of the whole thing, frankly, makes it seem more suspicious. Because I I'm I'm fully I'm not someone who's kind of um doggedly committed to the idea that you know there, there's a maximalist version of this argument that says all oh, Ukrainians are Nazis and la 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 la. But like I, it, it is it is very frustrating to see the knee jerk response to any reference. Like at very least, you'd be like, "Oh gosh, someone's doing terrible PR to to keep letting all these Nazis get get through." You know what I mean? And it, it, there's a real credibility issue that's happening with folks who have that kind of a visceral reaction um, to stating the obvious. Not to mention, I don't know if there was any follow up on this, but you know, just what was it, like a month or so ago, maybe two months months ago now, that there was the CBS report on on how. Like thirty percent of all arms to Ukraine yeah. were had gone missing, and then they retracted it, seemingly in response to the public backlash. Yeah, the the backlash from the Ukrainian government and from uh, the U.S. establishment 
forced CBS to simply just uh, take their story offline and re-edit it. I mean, that was their response. They they, they reported uh, on how the U.S. cannot keep track of these weapons, and a lot of them are not even reaching the front lines. And based on no factual uh, dispute, like no one fact-checked them and said, fact-checked them and said, this is what you got wrong. It was just sheer outrage and rancor that got CBS to just take it off off of the air and to re-edit the story. And that's how media works here. It's like, it's what Chomsky and Herman talked about in manufacturing consent of the flack mechanism and enforcing the propaganda line where you give someone who dissents enough flack that, you know, either they'll, either they will retract as was the case with CBS or other people will think twice about uh, not towing the party line. And this was a good way of enforcing the narrative just by subjecting CBS to all that uh, vitriol. And it's, um, Look, unfortunately, though, the uh, facts are there. And look, you don't have to adopt the Kremlin line. And Kremlin that refers to Ukraine as a Nazi government. I mean, not everyone in the Ukrainian government are Nazis. My point is there's an outsized role of neo-Nazis inside of Ukraine. They took credit openly for the coup of 2014. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you can read in foreign policy that the coup was dominated by fascists and brought mm-hmm. to power fascists. I mean, a large number of cabinet ministers who were appointed after the coup of 2014 were fascist. Um, what do we mean by that, by the way? Because we just had a couple of episodes where we, you know, we just talked about whether or not Georgia Maloney is a fascist. And I had Cornell West talking about whether or not Biden's a fascist. And the word does get thrown around a lot in a way that I don't necessarily think is true or untrue. It just means so many different things to so many different people. So were these people who are, you know, associated with uh, you know, the Azov Battalion or who there, espoused a certain kind of beliefs. Yeah, go ahead. There's the Azov Battalion. There's something called Democratic Acts. There's right sector. There's a gang called C-14 where mm. he said, he said actually this year, he said, if it wasn't for us, the Maidan protest would have been a gay pride parade. Mm. And he was basically taking credit for turning these peaceful protests initially, which is what they were, into a coup. And he's saying that if not for us, it would have been a gay pride parade. And so these are people who attack minorities inside of Ukraine and who worship this guy, Stefan Bandera, who was a Nazi and who hate Russians, uh, who burned Russians alive in Odessa in May 24, in May 2014, who have made life very difficult for Russian speakers in the Donbass for the last eight years in supporting uh, this war against them. Some of them support banning the Russian language. So that's yeah. the kind of fascism that they uh, practice. Well, what do we know about how folks uh, in the Russian speaking regions are feeling these days? Because at the beginning of the conflict, there was some assumption or evidence that, you know, they were sympathetic and it would be relatively easy for Russia to take those regions. As time has gone on, there has been a narrative that they are obviously so negatively impacted by the fighting that they just wanted to stop and it has turned them against Russia and they are you know, very, very critical of the invasion because of how it's negatively impacted their lives. You know, do do you have the sense, is there reporting that you find to be credible about what the, like, attitudes on the ground are right now? I mean, that's very hard to answer, especially at a time of war. I, um, I think in 2014, if Russia had invaded then, I actually think you would have had more support uh, in those regions for Russia then than Russia has now, because right now it's been eight years of a war in which people are being attacked by uh, the Ukrainian government and Russia didn't come to their aid then except for supplying, you know, limited amounts of of arms. And I think they feel abandoned. They also actually there are people who now feel abandoned by Russia in the places where Russia has withdrawn from. And they feel as if Russia's put them in a really bad position that Russia should never have come in in the first place if Mm -hmm. they weren't going to commit enough resources to really hold on to all these territories that they've lost. And Russia, I don't think, bargained for the fact that they're not fighting just the Ukrainian army. They're fighting against the Ukrainian army. They're fighting against a Ukrainian army that's been trained by NATO for eight years. Mm -hmm. The U.S. has been training tens of thousands of troops in Ukraine and building them up into a NATO army with NATO equipment. I don't think Russia fully appreciated that when they invaded. And look, I, I know, I mean, we've seen people interviewed who are very happy at the prospect of Russia uh, annexing those territories because they've long identified as Russian. I mean, many people in Ukraine identify as Russian uh, and many people's first language is Russian. I believe Poroshenko, who uh, was a previous president of Ukraine, who was you know, pro-coup, I think his first language was was Russian. So there are obviously people inside Ukraine who identify with Russia, but 
I can't speak for um, those who might, you know, be uh, very upset that Russia launched this disastrous invasion and displaced them from their homes. So I, I imagine that it's it's uh, it. I imagine that it varies. In, in, in Crimea, I know for a fact. I'm very confident to say the majority of people there were very happy with the annexation in 2014. That's to me indisputable. Other places, I'm sure it, it's mixed. The the voices that we don't hear are those who support what Russia is doing, and they do exist, obviously. But in terms of like what the majority really thinks, um, I can't really say that without even without ever ever having uh, been there. And that's why you know Musk, when he proposed having internationally supervised referendums, I think that's a great idea. Uh, that would be the only credible way to find out uh, one way or the other. One way or the other. Yeah, of course. You know, inevitably there are people who are going to say you can't trust the election results. That how can you have a free and fair election in a in a, a region so riddled with conflict? I mean, you see this. You know, if we have a conversation about almost anything. You know, oh, the COVID rates in some country are better than here. Oh, you can't trust the numbers coming out of there, or you can't. And and it's true. Like, there's always some level of obscurity when looking at any of these kind of statistics. And of course, we're sitting here in the United States of America. Who who am I to say <laughs> that there isn't a ripe environment to be questioning election results in some other part of the world, um, given the discourse we've had over the last couple of years? But it does seem better than nothing. That's all. Like, it, it does it seem is. better than the alternative. Of course it is. It, there's a sizable number of people. I don't know how many. Um, a sizable number of people, possibly even the majority, um, who totally support joining Russia because they identify as Russian. And that's been at the center of this war for the last eight years uh, between the Donbass and the Ukrainian government. I just don't, you know, I agree, though, that a referendum held very quickly and held under military occupation, where, for example, you know, people who might not support joining Russia may have already fled. You know, I don't uh, think we can just accept those results on faith. But I'm also not going to dismiss the possibility that there's a sizable number of people, possibly even the vast majority, who actually support joining Russia. So you said earlier that, you know, Russia has its own nuclear doctrine and won't basically use nuclear weapons unless it feels like there's an existential threat to its own territory. Does the annexations of the Russian-speaking regions of Ukraine create a situation where there is a Russian territory, as it were, or land that is claimed to be Russian territory that is now an active war zone and and, 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 and basically provokes that existential threat to land that is considered to be now Russia, Russian. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. I don't know the answer. If Russia goes ahead with this annexation, which it actually is doing as we're, as we're speaking, then presumably, yeah, Russia enforcing its doctrine would apply to those territories. But uh, I guess it comes down to how you define existential. And could Russia, if Russia were to lose one of these regions, would it lose nuclear weapons? I don't think so necessarily. But I'm saying that based on the hope that Russia is not crazy and suicidal. But I don't know that yeah, for sure. I mean, I've personally defined existential as not getting a headboard until I was 35 years old, but <laughs> to, to each your own. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I also do want to talk about... Um, what in fact are what is the likelihood of Ukraine actually joining NATO at this point? Because isn't it also the case that NATO won't allow a new member to join if they are involved in a country that is on the other side of the NATO defense treaty? Like it won't it's not going to let a country in that would automatically trigger NATO's involvement. Uh, I don't know about that part about not admitting a country that's actively at war. I, I hope that's the case, actually, because that could help prevent World War III. But um, I think what's prevented uh, Ukraine from joining NATO is, first of all, it's a very corrupt country. And, uh, you know, people in NATO have been hesitant about letting in Ukraine with all of its domestic problems. And also, you know, uh, France and Germany have been very hesitant. And they've basically been the ones holding the line on preventing Ukraine from joining after George W. Bush pushed through this promise to uh, Ukraine and Georgia that they'll one day join NATO in 2008, which, by the way, was done overruling his own advisors, including Fiona Hill, who's now a very prominent Russia expert in the U.S. She advised him not to because she said it would be too provocative to Russia to do that. Mm -hmm. So I don't. Um, 
In terms of the obstacles, I think uh, Ukraine's uh, corruption is an obstacle. And also, yeah, the fact that it's at war is hopefully another major obstacle, too. But it's funny, you know, early on in the uh, in, after Russia invaded, Zelensky made a really damning admission. I'm not sure if he meant to or not, but he was on CNN and he said that for a long time he was asking, you know, uh, NATO to pledge to let him join. And the response he got, I'm paraphrasing him, hopefully I'm remembering correctly, he said that the answer was that you will never join NATO, but publicly we're going to keep the doors open. Mm -hmm. So basically we're going to keep the doors open to an outcome that publicly, that in privately we're telling you is never going to happen, which says to me that they were telling Zelensky that we want to use you and the prospect of you joining NATO to provoke Russia. Because if you're telling Zelensky you're never going to join NATO, why would you want him to leave the door open in public just to just to like not back down to Russia? Uh, and that's the takeaway that I got from that. And Zelensky didn't seem to have any um, outrage that he was being used to bait Russia. I mean, that's how I interpret his comments. But I thought that was pretty revealing. I, I want to perhaps end with a somewhat of a provocative question. So much of our foreign policy is predicated on a belief that Russia is a quote unquote threat in whatever way that means, whether it's in a kind of domino theory-esque um, way where we just have to ensure quote unquote democracies around the world um, and stand up for capitalism or, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever those kind of regressive ideas were, whether it's because of a threat of an actual land grab um, uh, like an invasion that we're seeing. And something that has been coming up a little bit in some conversations on Rising recently is folks who have um, attributed immigration crises and the like to the influence of communism or socialism in Latin America. And one, I think, really interesting moment of pushback that has come out of these conversations is the question of if X, if, if X system of government is so threatening, then why is it that America is so continually involved in overthrowing, you know, democratically elected versions of those governments or leaders in those places instead of just letting communism or socialism rise and fall on its own merits if it's, if it's so obviously a bad idea and so obviously destructive? And it's interesting to me, I, I, was, I found myself thinking about how far one could extend that logic and, you know, how much Russia, I mean, I, I don't mean to be naive. I mean, obviously, it's a fine line between having some weird investment in American hegemony or Western hegemony and like not recognizing that there are things, that, ways that things are done in other parts of the world that are obviously are not my bag and that as an American, I... There's a certain comfort, familiarity in, in your own kind of um, status quo. And I don't want to be too glib about the what the harms that can happen if there are these global shifts in power and America is no longer number one. But, you know, I, I do think it's I do find it to be kind of an interesting philosophical question of what what is actually our foreign policy goal here when we say that Russia is a threat. Uh, well, you Russia, know, do, 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 yeah. do what I'm yeah, getting at? Go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Uh, Russia is a threat from the point of view of uh, U.S. planners because it's a deterrent to U.S. hegemony. And whenever someone is a deterrent to U.S. hegemony, uh, they are targeted. It doesn't matter that Russia is an autocracy, which it is. The U.S. does business with plenty of autocrats, even autocrats far more brutal than Vladimir Putin, far more brutal. So it's not about the fact that Putin is an autocrat. Uh, it's about that Russia is a powerful country, which can be a deterrent to U.S. hegemony. It showed that in Syria when Russian intervention was instrumental in preventing regime change, which was the U.S. goal. That's why I was spending billions of dollars to arm uh, sectarian death squads. Um, and any deterrent to U.S. hegemony, whether it's Cuba or Venezuela or Iran or Russia, uh, will be targeted for regime change or at least for destabilization to make things difficult for, for the country. And so that's why it's been targeted. I mean, this has been the goal for a very, very long time. And, and Russia is a particular problem for the US uh, from that point of view, because unlike you know, Cuba or Syria, these you know, relatively you know, weaker, smaller countries, Russia is a massive country. It's like you know, a huge percentage of the world's like land mass. And also, yeah. it, it, also it, it has nuclear weapons and it has energy, it has resources. So 
it can defend itself and it can actually make alliances. So you can see that happening now with China and India and others, and most of the world actually, not going along with uh, US dictates. And so accordingly, it's being targeted for overthrow, which has always been the case. That's why the US has spent, so that's why the US cares so much about Ukraine. They don't care about the Ukrainian people, but Ukraine, because it's right on Russia's border and given its historical and cultural ties with Russia, if you get in there, you can um, make things difficult for Russia and you can actually force it to spend a lot of money and resources doing what it's doing right now, uh, you know, similar to what the U.S. did in, in Afghanistan by using that to bleed the Soviet Union. It's not different than that. So that, I think, is the simple explanation I can give, is that anybody who is a deterrent to U.S. hegemony is a target. It's it's such a difficult thing to talk about, I think, because there is this implication that you're kind of naive to the benefits as an American of American hegemony, right? But I don't understand how you can be principled and not be willing to kind of take that take the hit and say the obvious thing. But when when you say stuff like that, you get a lot of like, well, what do you want China to be in control? What do you want to be thrown in the gulag? Well, uh, if there was any threat of China taking over the U.S. or Russia taking over the U.S. and throwing me in a gulag, I could take that <laughs> argument seriously. But I, I don't see that. I don't see China and um, Russia trying to dominate the world. I see them trying to protect their own uh, narrow interests. It's different with the U.S. The U.S. is, what, 900 military bases around the world, constantly starting wars, sanctioning probably more than half the world's population, which is another form of warfare where people can't eat or get the medicines they need from Syria to Cuba. Actually, not Cuba, because Cuba has a good medical they, system. They've got their good, yeah. yeah. They've, but, they've cured but, lung cancer or whatever. Yeah, exactly. So I, I should exactly, <laughs> but the point is, the U.S. has an um, has a domination over the world. So the U.S. is actually, you know, if, if it's not if it's not throwing people in gulags elsewhere, it is making their lives very difficult. I mean, I went to Syria a year ago, and it's awful. Uh, people have to wait in long lines for fuel because the U.S. is basically blockading their economy and also occupying the territory in Syria that actually has their oil. The U.S. is occupying one third of Syria, which we never talk about really in the U.S., but they're there and they're there as Dana Struhl, who is a uh, now official under Biden, explained, to give the U.S. leverage over Syria because the region the U.S. is occupying has its wheat and its oil. And Syrians are starving and going without the basics they need because of that and because of the sanctions. So in terms of, you know, who's dominating the world right now, it's, I, it's the U.S. doing it. And as for the benefits to average citizens for, uh, you know, of hegemony, first of all, I don't see those benefits at all. I just see tax dollars being robbed to go make life miserable for people elsewhere. But even if it were yeah. true, even if there was some kind of benefit to U.S. hegemony, I don't want any benefit that derives from killing kids elsewhere, yeah. from depriving people of cancer medicine or stealing their oil. I don't want that benefit. Yeah, I'm I'm working up to my borders aren't moral uh, take on immigration. I'm trying to get someone to come on, but everyone's too afraid to touch the subject with a 10, <laughs> 10 foot pole. But I, I'm working on it. If you know. Angela Nagel, poke her because <laughs> I'm trying to no. I'm trying to get a super panel going um, of everyone who's had the spicy what should the immigration uh, policy of the left takes over the years to come on and hash it out once and for all. But look, I always appreciate hearing from you, Aaron, the coverage that you do on these matters that you and Katie cover over at Useful Idiots, the coverage that you do over at Gray Zone. It's it's so important because there is really just one worldview that you get overwhelmingly here. And, you know, I know that you catch a lot of flack and gray zone catches a lot of heat. Um, and I just really encourage folks that even if you don't agree with every opinion or take that it is important to understand what countervailing opinions are, especially since much of the world is getting that information and having a very different perspective on U.S. involvement and how we're behaving around the world as a country. I frankly love to see all of the pushback from the global South over the Ukraine-Russia conflict, where they are really not trying to be lumped in to America's project here and are very upset about the extent to which they're negatively impacted by the supply chain crises, crises, crises that emanate from um, not being able to access Ukrainian grain and things like that. So um, we'll continue to follow it. Can you let our listeners know, as though they don't already, where to find you on the internet uh, and all your various shows and writings? 
So I'm at the gray zone, the gray zone.com where I host a show pushback and publish articles. I'm also on Substack at matthay.substack.com and check out useful idiots. Uh, the show I co-host with Katie helper, useful idiots.substack.com. And Bree, thank you. Do you also have a call on show? Oh, I do have a call on show. Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. I'm on there as well. And okay. Bree, thank you. This was really fun. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Uh, all of you guys know that this is a twice a week show. You can catch uh, the show on Thursdays for free. And you can also subscribe at patreon.com slash bad faith podcast for an extra Monday episode that you can both listen to and watch with your subscription. Take care of yourselves and keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash bad faith podcast. That's patreon.com slash bad faith podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.